Well, back in 2014, I was sitting at a city bus stop in the huge city of Rome, Italy, and I was with about 10 of my friends that we were studying abroad with, and all of a sudden, two men, two local men, started walking towards our group, and we thought nothing of it. There's three million people in Rome, so why wouldn't there be other people there? And one of them that walked by us brushed up against my shoulder and kind of knocked me out of my position a little bit. I thought nothing of it. And as a Minnesotan, very Midwestern person, I was the one who apologized, even though he ran into me. But as soon as this interaction happened, I felt an entire adult human hand go into my pocket. And I was like, oh, I'm being pickpocketed right now. Our school trained us on this. They said, when we're around the city, people are going to try to run into you. They're going to try to cause an aversion or whatever. And that means they're trying to pickpocket you. And feeling in a, a whole hand go into your pocket, not only is that uncomfortable, it's very unsettling. Now, I'm somebody who's generally pretty aware of my, of my surroundings. I'm not an expert on security or anything like that, but I'm pretty aware of where the exits are, who's here, who's not here, who's around me. I have an awareness of that. And so my first instinct, which wasn't the right instinct at all, but my first instinct when I felt that hand go into my pocket was I chased after the guys. I wasn't like sprinting after them, but I was on a very brisk walk following them. Now, I hadn't thought through it at all, right? This was the dumbest decision I could have possibly made because they could have had a gun, could have had knives, whatever, could have gotten killed. But I started going after these guys, and all of a sudden I could hear my whole group behind me saying, Justin, get back here. Justin, where are you going? And they're getting very worried. I'm like, yeah, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm just following these guys that tried to pickpocket me. But this comes from this heightened sense of awareness and out of instincts, this is what I did. And of course, it could have gone very, very poorly. But I want to ask you this question. Maybe you're just like me and you have this or a heightened awareness of your surroundings. I think most of the men in the room, we have this, right? Because we want to protect our families, our wives, and the people around us. But I want to ask you this. When it comes to your spiritual health, not just your safety, but your spiritual health, are you aware of where you're at today? Do you have a heightened sense of awareness of how the worldly influences are influencing you in your life today? You know, we just talked last week about what it means to live in the light versus living in the darkness. And what that means is living in the light is walking in this vulnerability, walking in this attitude of confession and repentance that I am a broken sinner in need of grace. And when you walk in the light and you walk in that attitude, you are heightened and your awareness is heightened. And everything that influences you, every sin that you're struggling with, you are ready and willing to admit that you struggle with it and you realize what it does to you. Now, walking in the darkness, walking in the darkness means hiding your sin in secrecy or even denying your, sin, your sinful condition as a whole. So this is something that we have to be aware of. But as we think about living in the light versus living in the darkness, are you aware of the worldly influences that influence you and how that hinders your spiritual health and your spiritual growth? If you have your Bible, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 2 today, so go ahead and open it up. If not, it'll be up on the screen for you as well. We're going to read verses 15 through 27. Now in this, the first few verses we're going to go through first, and then we're going to read the rest of it in a moment. John sort of splits up his passage here. The first couple of verses, this is sort of a benediction or a summary of what's already been said in the first half of this book and then what's also going to be said in the rest of the book, considering sin and darkness versus light and holiness. Here's what he says. He says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, it's key here to define what is the world that John is talking about. And I want you to hear this. He's not anti-recycling. He's also probably not a tree hugger either. He's not talking about planet Earth in and of itself as in the world. He's talking about the things in the world, these created things, materialism. So here's what I want us to hear. John is not against anybody wanting a classic ragtop Bronco. I would love one of those. John is not against anybody having a big house or a nice car or a nice iPhone. He's not against having things. It's when, when our time and our energy and our focus is all towards wanting things or things in the world. That's when we realize that the world is influenced so much that we would rather have the things in the world and that's what we would rather live for 
than to live for the Father. Now, like I said, it's not bad to have those things, but when our desires are out of line, when our focus is out of check, when we want those things rather than God's presence and God's goodness in our lives, that's when love for the world has overcome our love for Jesus. And so John is coming back, as we've just talked about living in the light versus living in the darkness, and he says that, in summary, if you love the world more than you love the Father, then what we need to do is we need to walk in awareness. What are the influences of the world that have been coming into my life and how they affected my faith? Where in my spiritual life have I been loving the world more than I've been loving Jesus? And he defines what it means to love the world. He says it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Is there an area in your life where you think the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes for you has overcome your love for the Father? Or maybe for you, it's the pride of life. The pride of life includes anything that brings sinful pride to our hearts. You know, do you live for and find your whole identity in your job? Your job is a good thing. Your 401k and your bank account, those are good, helpful tools that you need to live this life. But if, you're, if your entire identity is found in these things, that can be taken away from you in just a moment. And so to put all of your time and your energy and focus into just your job or just your bank account or just your house or an old right top Bronco that I would love, anybody wants to gift one, I'm not going gonna, gonna to force you as your pastor. But the love for the world and the pride of life can so easily ensnare us and can hinder us in our faith. So we all need a spiritual reality check. So this is the first half. The second half of what John says is the rest of the passage, and he's going to get more serious about a very specific issue that's happening in this church that he writes to. He says this, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained in us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you, you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I did not write to you because you did not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from it. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, See what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Now I want to kind of break this down. John begins by talking about the Antichrist. And oftentimes when we hear the Antichrist, we immediately go back to the 1990s and we think of the Left Behind series and we get terrified. Now, John is writing in sort of apocalyptic literature, but he is not trying to write about the end times as if all of us need to break out our charts and try to chart out when Jesus is coming back. It's not his point of why he's writing. He's writing because he's trying to create a sense of urgency in this church. And the reason for that is because there were Christians within the church who had started believing in a false teaching. And what happened is they were preaching the gospel every single Sunday. They were teaching the word of God. They were following Jesus. Life was good. But then somebody comes into the church and they're influenced by another teaching and they start spreading it around the church. Soon enough, they have a little coup going and they all leave the church and they go start their own church. And this happens all the time. But this false teaching that, that they got influenced by was called Gnosticism. Now, you may have never heard of Gnosticism before, and going from here, you might not ever care what Gnosticism is, but let me explain it to you. Gnosticism says that anything in the physical world 
is inherently evil. But anything in the spiritual world is inherently good, meaning even the very bodies that we have, we are inherently evil. Nothing good can be done with our human bodies. The world itself is in planet Earth, the trees, the grass, everything in it, everything is inherently bad. The goal of Gnosticism is to overcome the physical world by perfecting your spirit. Now, the problem with this is not only does this go against Christian teaching because we believe that the world is also good and so is the spirit. If you follow Gnosticism, the result of it and what was happening in this church that, that John is speaking against is you can claim that any sin that you commit, well, that's just my body. That's just my body doing what it does. That's just the world doing what it does. As long as my, my spirit and my intentions are good, then I'm good. And what people were doing in the church is they would sleep around. They would go on benders. They would do whatever they wanted to do. And they would come back to church and people would call them out for it. And they'd say, hey, that's just my flesh. What a good excuse, right? Gnosticism, when you mix it with Christianity, it becomes an excuse not to be changed. It becomes a reality where I can come to church, I can say that I follow Jesus, but I don't have to do anything about that. I don't have to confess my sins. I don't have to repent of my sins. I don't actually have to do anything. As long as my spirit and my intentions are good, I'm saved. Now, you can see where this would go wrong. Because the basic foundation of Christianity isn't that we just become the morally perfect people and everybody does good things, right? Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't date at the girls that do. It becomes all about what you do. Right? As Christians, we want to do good things, but we don't do them because they save us. And we don't do them just because it's good to be a moral person. We become moral people because Jesus has transformed us from the inside out. We become better people and we do good things and we want to do good things because when you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, the Bible teaches that your whole spirit, your whole self is called regenerated. You were dead in your sins and now you're alive in Christ. If that has truly happened to you, you have become transformed and no longer do you want to live as a slave to your sin, but you actually want to be obedient to Christ. It's not even about legalism anymore. It's not about just following the rules. We want to follow the rules. We want to do what the Bible says because we have been made new and we see the light. We don't see the Bible or we don't see God's rules or regulations or anything like that as, as a hindrance, as, oh, I gotta follow these things. We see them as life-giving. Because slavery is sin, and sin is slavery. We have this idea sometimes that we can just do whatever we want, and if we, we can do that, we can have the ultimate desire of freedom. But how many of you know personally that that ultimate desire of freedom, that ultimate value of freedom, often leads you into slavery of sin? We have to check our desires in our hearts and we have to understand what false teaching can do to us my encouragement to you today is to remember the truth of the gospel and the truth of the bible and look at what john says in the midst of all this false teaching in the midst of people leaving the church he says this remember your anointing Remember your anointing. When you became a Christian at salvation, when you gave your life to Jesus, what came upon you, if it was a genuine conversion experience, what came upon you was the Holy Spirit. Every single one of you has the Holy Spirit. Not just me as your pastor, not just Pastor Bill, not just Pastor John, not just us holy guys. Every single one of you has been given the Holy Spirit. And what comes with that is sort of like scales being lifted off your eyes. Now you know the truth and you have the ability to discern. You have the ability to know what is true, what is right, what is biblical versus what is unbiblical and untrue and worldly. You have the ability to discern between two, these two things. So that when false teachings come into the church or when you're on social media and you hear somebody talking about whatever topic, you have the ability to say, hey, yes, this is good or no, this seems murky. 
This seems like it's going against my biblical values. This seems like it's going against the gospel and what the Bible has taught me, what my pastor has taught, what we've learned in Bible study. This seems to be going against the truth. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have been anointed and you have the ability to discern what is good, right, and true versus what is evil and unbiblical. Now, like I said earlier, you might have no care in the world about Gnosticism. And truth be told, as I was studying for this sermon, I was like, I understand that Gnosticism still has a little bit of influence in our culture, but I think that there are more false teachings in our culture today that are more important. For our cultural moment that we live in in 2023, there's a lot of false teachings that can pop up in our churches, in our individual walks with Jesus. There's a lot of false gospels, a lot of false teachings that can creep into our faith. And the reason why these are so bad is they lead our hearts astray and they cause us to doubt what we've learned. They cause us to doubt the very roots of Christianity. See, Gnosticism is still around. We see influences of it when people, if you've ever heard people talk about how they use energy crystals or they do transcendental meditation or they practice manifestation rather than prayer. All of these are heavily influenced. The spiritual language, this new age spirituality is heavily influenced by Gnosticism. But if you ask me, there's other false teachings that I think that we need to be aware of based on what our anointing has told us. Right? You've been anointed with the Holy Spirit. You've been given the truth. So be aware of what's happening, not only in your life personally, what sins that you're struggling with, but with the teachings that are happening around you. One of the biggest ones that I see today is how political ideologies have influenced the church. We have to be so careful that we are not letting our politics become our idol rather than the truth of the gospel and becoming what we serve. We have to be so careful that we're not bringing these outside worldly influences of politics into our church. Now, I believe Christians should engage in politics. I believe Christians should be in the voting booths and even in office. But we have to be so careful that that doesn't steal all of our time and our energy and effort and rather living for the kingdom of God does. Political ideologies are destroying so many churches. We have to know the truth. We have to remember our anointing. Another false teaching that I think is being brought into the church in some ways is we have been influenced since the 1970s on the sexual revolution and sexual culture. If you were alive back then, you see how it's influenced us even today in 2023. Today, we have new revolutions. We have the gender revolution. And it's not just the outside secular world that's being influenced by these thinkings. It is even the church world. We have to remember our anointing. We've got people in our church, I believe today, struggling with what I like to call spiritual passivity. And what that means is it's, it's this idea of universalism. This idea that every religion, we're all, we're all worshiping the same God, but every religion just expresses that differently, even though we're all worshiping the same God. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I love that you want to be tolerant. I love that you want to be kind. But at the end of the day, we need to stand on the truth. And this is what John is encouraging his church to do. There's a lot of influences out in the world and a lot of that easily creeps into the church and it can plague us. It can lead us astray from the actual truth. But you know this, remember your anointing. You have been given the Holy Spirit. Use that to discern how the world is not only influencing the church, but how the world is influencing you. It's so crucial that we take John's encouragement and we stand on the truth. That freedom doesn't become our ultimate value. That kindness doesn't become our ultimate value. Love for the Father becomes our ultimate value. And when love for the Father is your ultimate value, you will be kind. You will be loving. You won't always be affirming, but you will be somebody who walks in peace and knows the truth in a world full of ever-changing truths. It is imperative that we remember our anointing and remember the basic foundations of the faith that we share. This is crucial. And I think one of the things that affects us 
is that in conversations like these, where we are told to stand for the truth, oftentimes we want to push ourselves towards our own little Christian bubbles. And I think that this is something that we need to be wise in, but also be very careful in. And one of the big topics that has been brought up today is the argument over the public school system versus homeschool versus private school. If you're a parent of young kids, you are probably thinking, what the heck should I do? It's a big conversation. I mean, for, for me personally, we have our daughter in a private school, Cambridge Christian School. We love it. Bill Berg, our senior pastor, he sent all of his kids to public school. John Foley has done both home, he's our other pastor, homeschool, private school, and public school. So there you go. <laughs> if, you, if you need an answer to a question today, I just gave you one. No, but this is the question. How do we both protect ourselves and protect our kids, but also do the biblical call of being in the world, but not of the world? Because our never, nowhere in scripture is our call to live out of fear and to hide ourselves and to just get in our little Christian bubbles and to just stay here so that we're safe and our kids are safe. Nowhere in scripture are we commanded to do that. In fact, the one who has anointed you in the book of John, he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. Our faith should never be out of fear, but it should always be out of discernment. In fact, I love what Pastor Tim Keller says. He says, Christians must learn to do something new. Engage the world critically, yet not capitulate to the reigning ideology in order to be truly salt and light in society rather than part of its decay. What, what Pastor Tim Keller is teaching us here in this moment is we need to engage the world in a way where we're not shutting ourselves out from it. We also don't want to be a part of its decay, but we have been called to be salt and light. And so we need to use this, uh, this discernment versus how do we be in the world and not of the world. And basically what Tim Keller here is saying is that you don't need to be Amish, but you also have to walk in awareness, right? What do the Amish do? The Amish take the influence of the world so seriously and so literally, they don't even use electricity. Now, I would venture to believe that most of us aren't willing to go that far, and I'm not either. But at the same time, there is a seriousness about this. There is a level of we don't want to be influenced by the world. And so how do we be in the world but not of it? And again, it's walking in discernment and walking in awareness. And using your time of prayer, using the word, the Bible, as your gatekeeper to know what is worldly and to know what is biblical. So here's what I'd like to do as we close this morning. I want you to remember your anointing. Remember the truth. And if for you, you're thinking, man, I don't even know if I remember the truth. It's been 10 years since I read my Bible. It's been a year since I've prayed. It's never too late to start. I'm not going to stand up here and guilt you. It's never too late to start. And if you want to start leading yourself, leading your family, and becoming spiritually healthy and spiritually stronger and spiritually aware, you have to start today. But I want to, I want to ask you these questions. What are the things in the world that have been influencing you the most? Are you aware of how the world has influenced you personally? I'm not talking right now about the general population, how you're so angry at, at this group of people or this group of people and how we need to group together and stand on the ground or go protest and do whatever. I'm talking about you as an individual right now in your relationship with Jesus. How are you being influenced by the world? Now think of the categories of social media. Money, power, lust, greed, pride. Is there anything in your life that has taken over your love for the Father where you are so focused on this and has taken all your time, all your energy, all your focus, all your resources, and is stealing your joy and is stealing your love for God? Is there anything in the world that is keeping you from loving Jesus the way that you are called to love Jesus? You know, right now, I think a really big issue 
is social media. And I'm, I'm on it, so I'm not going to tell you that you are all wrong for being on it. And I don't believe social media is bad in and of itself, but here's a, in and of itself, but here's a problem that I see all the time. So we, we spend so much time scrolling on our phones, and while the, while the Bible has called us children of God, it's given us an identity, it's called us to be secure and not fearful, we scroll on our phones for hours, and what do we do? We automatically start comparing ourselves to other people. Statistically, you are three times more likely to be chronically anxious or depressed if you spend most of your time on social media. So we are told to not be fearful. We're told to live in peace. And yet we're the most anxious and depressed generation in history. Now, social media isn't bad, but it directly influences your life. You don't have to go full Amish, but you have to watch yourself. Is your addiction to social media robbing your joy and causing you to compare yourself to every other person? If it is, walk in that awareness. Set some boundaries. We don't want anything in this world to steal our love for the Father. But at the end of the day, that's an easy one to talk about. And it's been on my heart for the last couple of days to bring up a more difficult subject. And by doing so, I want to do so in grace and in love. But I think our world has so influenced us today that we are so easily ensnared and trapped into sin and led astray. And one of those things, one of those categories that I've seen lately, and it's been a huge hot topic for a long time, is abortion. Now, as a church, and maybe even you personally, You probably know where you stand. You probably know where the church stands. We believe that while the world says a woman has a right to choose, the Bible teaches a right to life. And for us, it's no contest. Every life matters. And the world has so influenced our thinking that even sometimes Christians, we get a little bit soft on this. I'm not, I'm not going to teach us to go up in the streets and start protesting and start breaking buildings, anything like that. It'll get violent. I don't want you to get mad and angry. What I want you to do is take it seriously and stand on the truth. But I also know this, that there are women in our church who have had abortions. There are men in our church who have paid for them. There are men in our church who have driven their wives or their girlfriends to the clinic. And what I want you to hear is this. There is grace and forgiveness for everybody. No matter how influenced we've been by the world, the good news of the gospel is that there is grace and forgiveness for every single man or woman. True, true forgiveness. And I want you to hear that if you're one of those people who's made that decision, And you've confessed that, you've repented. Here's what I believe. That when Revelation 21, 3 and 4 says that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, there will be no more mourning, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. When sin has passed away, when guilt and shame has passed away, I believe every single one of us will be in heaven reunited with every single man, woman, and child. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that those victims will look at you and say, what did you do? But I believe that because of Revelation 21, 3 and 4, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and we will be reunited. That there will be moments of forgiveness and joy and reconciliation. We don't have to be influenced by the world's thinking. And if we have been, there's freedom and forgiveness and joy in Jesus. I believe we will look in the eye of every loved one in heaven and we will be with each other in joy. No matter what sins you've committed, no matter what ways the world has influenced you, all the way from social media to abortion to an affair, There is true, true forgiveness in Jesus. And the reason for this is because he loves us deeply. There is nothing that you can do to separate yourself from the love of the Father. The Bible says there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. 
You want to know what he says to those of us who have lied, who have cheated, who've had abortions, who've had affairs? He says there is no condemnation. If you're in Christ and you have a relationship with Jesus today, there is no condemnation for you. You can walk in freedom. And so I want to ask you the question again as we close. Pull the classic preacher move and preach for 10 more minutes after I said we're done. <laughs> How has the world influenced you? How is it influencing, right, influencing you right in this moment? Do you need to check how much, you watch, how much you're on social media? I know the while they're on tonight. I know we stand up till midnight again watching the playoffs, but do you need to check how much sports are running your life right now? Do you need to look at your bank account and say, what do I truly value because this is what I've been spending my money on? Church, our goal is to not be perfect people. But our goal is to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. All the way from Gnosticism to the sexual and gender revolutions, so many vast false teachings can influence you and influence our church. Let's remember the anointing and remember the truth. Let's pray.